Uh, I'm Lois Weiner. I'm a member of the New Politics Editorial Board, and I'm talking with Sam Gindin today about the book that he wrote with Leo Panitch, The Making of Global Capitalism. And Sam, I'm going to ask you questions that members of the New Politics Editorial Board um, wanted you to discuss about your book. Uh, the first question is, is it accurate to say that in the book you conclude that the U.S. informal empire consists of a globally integrated capitalism in which the super-exploitation of the global south increasingly subsidizes northern profits and consumption of workers in the global north? And it's okay to say that you do not conclude that in the book. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, it's not quite what we're saying. Uh, and uh, let me contrast how the left used to think about the question, the contradictions of uh, glo global capitalism, of imperialism, to how we're trying to articulate it, and then get to your question. Uh, the left used to think of the contradictions in terms of the contradictions amongst the capitalist powers. They each had their own empire and were competing with each other on the one hand. And then the contradiction between the, the leading capitalist powers and the global south as the underdeveloped space. What we're trying to argue is that what happens with global capitalism, what first happened after the war, was that the densest linkages actually ended up to be between the former imperial powers. So it was breaking down this fragmented global uh, world order uh, and uniting uh, the British Empire, the French Empire, into the making of a global capitalism, which quite successfully integrated them. And I don't think it's useful, Leo and I don't think it's useful now, to think in terms of just tensions, but to think of contradictions and conflicts between them. In terms of the global south, what we have to appreciate, I think that's changed, is the image of the global south used to be. Uh, you know, it's a colony, it doesn't have a sovereign state, now they have sovereign states, that the control was basically through the military, and although the military is still in the background, now it's very much through markets, that the global south was resources, well now they're manufacturing, that the flow of capital was capital going from the north uh, to buying resources, whatever, uh, or and lending money and getting uh, interest on it. Now a lot of the capital is actually flowing into the mm. global north, especially from China, but not just from China, Brazil and Asia. So things have changed. So, so the contradictions now are very much that it's part of the making of global capitalism and it's the, it's the contradictions inside each country as they try to create the conditions for fitting into a global world order. So in the global south, you often have elites in the global south inviting capital in, capital in. They want to become part of a global. And somebody called this uh, imperialism by invitation rather than just somebody taking it over. And when you look at a country like China, you see growth. Growth in the global south is now faster than in the north. But it's a very uneven growth that's in increasing inequalities within those countries. And then when you look at you know the global north, the contradictions, and this leads to some of the other questions uh, I, I think you've, uh, you're planning to ask. The main contradictions we're emphasizing is the questions inside the capitalist states themselves. In, you know, as they're trying to, neoliberalism has been partly about, very much about, creating the domestic conditions that make a globalization possible. Weakening labor, freeing up finance, freeing up capital. And that involves class conflict inside the country. So let me jump in here. Would it be accurate to say that you're making the case for sovereign capital states in the global yeah. south? Is that yes? That 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 the, be, be, we have to think about this now as becoming a specifically capitalist empire. And what's unique about capitalism is that it involves sovereign states, and it try you know and to uh, and it uh -huh. operates through markets. So that's the framework on which we have to think about this. Okay, so I think... So maybe I could, and sorry, then yeah. that, that gets to the, the, the last part of your question when we think about, well, are the contradictions between workers in the global north yes. and the south? And it's, uh, again, there's, there's tensions, but what you see is that workers in the global north 
you know, whereas people have thought about it as well, they're just living off of the exploitation, they're an aristocratic elite. In fact, what's been happening is that, you know, growth has been faster in the global south. Workers in the global north have been restrained by this increased competition of this new global proletariat. So in the global north, what we've seen, especially through the 80s, 90s into the present, has been wages have actually been relatively restrained. They're benefiting from cheaper goods. That's absolutely true. Capital is benefiting from, you know, the reproduction of labor is cheaper because you can get so many goods from China. But, you know, incomes have been uh, restrained here. And in the global south, incomes have been growing. Now, there's still an enormous gap. And crucial to this is how uneven things are in the global south because they're, they're integrated so unevenly. So, you know, people talk about, you know, there's China growing very fast, there's Brazil growing very fast, but, uh, you know, in Africa you've got a different story, in Latin America you've got a different story, in Peru, mm -hmm. etc. So there's, a, it, there's nothing homogeneous going on in mm -hmm. the South. That's interesting. And maybe similarly the increasing inequalities in the global North in the nation states, in sovereign capitalist states, in the, in, in the global north, um, I don't want to say mimics what you're arguing is going on in the global south in that regard. That it's... Yeah, I don't know if mimics okay. the word in terms of causation, but what you do see is the uh, uh, inequality in the north is definitely everywhere increased. Uh, part of that has been... Uh, workers uh, being put into competition mm -hmm. with the Global South. And then in the Global South, what you see is that even as they grow, so you can say, well, the average wage in China, the average wage in the United States, or the average wage in Korea, that's narrow. But within Korea, what you see is this uh, dispersion of income. Right. More, uh, more greater inequality. inequality. Greater, greater inequality. inequality. Yeah. But we're we're still seeing this, what you referred to as this enormous disparity between the global north and the global south. Yeah, and part of that is that uh, there's nothing that says that the disparity is going to be closed. You know, there's one thing integrating Europe and France and the United States into a global capitalism. It's much harder in the, in, the, in the global south. You don't have the institutions, you don't have the social relationships yet. So this question of actually integrating the global south into capitalism is still problematic in a lot of countries. And even where it happens, it happens sometimes in ugly ways, sometimes in ways that have happened in the north. So this is still a process of going on, and you still have you know enormous inequalities. Mm -hmm. But you do see the inequalities between Korea on average, for example, and Europe on average shrinking. Mm. So you do, you do see that at the same time. You do see Brazil growing faster and maybe shrinking its average income relative to the United States. But then there are other countries where that isn't happening. Uh, and within Brazil, you see the inequalities growing. Right. So how would you answer this question? How can labor struggles be waged in the global north without capital sinking, offsetting redress through downward pressure Wage on wages and working conditions in the global south? Well, w once you start seeing the main conflict as be being between the north and the south, but actually occurring in each place, mm -hmm. you know, workers in the south, you know, the greatest threat to Venezuela is, is actually the Venezuelan elite mm -hmm. and then the U.S. Uh, supporting that. So they're so, both dynamics. They're both That's dynamics. what you're saying. There are yeah. two dynamics. Let me try to paraphrase yes. here to make sure I understand. You're a teacher, so you're great at this. Go ahead. Well, I don't know about that. But so what I hear you saying is that we have two dynamics going on simultaneously. We have the dynamic between the global north and the global, no the global south, in which there are these obvious and great disparities that remain still. Even though they're being integrated in a way they've never been integrated yes, before. Even, but we also have this integration that's occurred and that's continuing and that integration has meant that we have capitalist sovereign states in which we have increasing inequality in, in, in each of those states. Yeah. And but that the disparity between the global north and the global south in terms of the working class is diminishing. 
depending. I mean, you know, the, the class struggles depend on this. So, so the inequalities within the North, they spread. Mm -hmm. The fact that they spread is partly having to compete with lower wages, but it's also, you know, spreading because of the aggressiveness of capital there mm -hmm. and the weakness of labor. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are linked. It didn't, doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. And in, uh, yeah, and overall. We just can't think of the global south in a homogeneous way. Right. It's, it's so uneven because it's depending on capital, it's depending on winners and losers. But generally, whether the gap is shrinking in some cases or even spreading in others, uh, the gap is large still. And then that's the dynamic. Then in terms of this relationship between, well, what happens if workers in the north are trying to get higher wages? Does that just mean that they're going to squeeze workers in the south more? And I'd say no, that's not the dynamic. The dynamic is that they're always trying to squeeze as much as they can in the South anyways. When workers in the North or, or workers in the South can win things, what it does is it creates space for workers elsewhere to struggle. How when, when you're giving up something, what you're doing is undermining workers elsewhere. They're, they're, then they're just going to go and try to get the same thing there. But when you can actually, you know, when workers are struggling in the uh, United States, uh, it puts less pressure, you know, on workers in other countries. Well, I want to jump in and I want to say something that yeah. is not in this question. Yeah. So this is like a curveball to Sam. I'm okay. going to explain I, this. I like okay. It. So I want to jump in here and I want to talk about sustainable economies, okay. right? Environmentally sustainable economies and jobs, because if workers, if workers win improvements in working conditions, wages, the way what that has meant is more consumption, right? Yeah. And then we have the question of whether the environment and wh whether we can sustain the kind of, and whether we want to sustain the kind of consumption um, or spread it um, that we have in the global north, right? The, the, um, so what well, it's, a, it's a great question, I think, in two interrelated ways. Right. One is directly about the environment, I'll come back to that, and the other is that individual consumption has been such a crucial mechanism for integrating workers into capitalism. Right. So you end up with the two questions being linked. If you're going to move away from uh, individual consumption, uh, and you know, it, it means challenging the culture of capitalism and the structures of capitalism. And it's the same question with the environment. So first of all, I, I think it's absolutely true that if we just imagine workers in the North continuing to increase the standard of living even slowly in the old way, and then imagining the global South catching up, this means enormous environmental pressures. So the question is, well, how do you deal with this? Right. And I think, uh, you know, the. First of all, there has to be some solidaristic notion that the global south, you know, there's, there's a, a moral reason for why they do have to increase their material standard of living. So there has to be some redistribution between the north and south, but there's no mechanisms within capitalism to do, that. to do those things. You'd have to have both socialist consciousness, and you'd actually have to have some power. So you could transfer technology because it makes sense rather than being worried about it, or, or, or actually uh, you know, have a, have a redistribution system through controlling the state to do this. But I think what it means in terms of workers in the North is that we do have to think about what we mean by the quality of life. And we have to start questioning whether uh, certain kinds of uh, goods, public goods, should in fact be considered as being more valuable, better nursing homes, better education, than just having more uh, consumer goods. And I think that's a, you know that's a fundamental question to ask for ourselves because it isn't just a question of does that mean we have to now lower our standard of living and workers are greedy? No, it's a, it's a question of having to think differently about what we value, so we can actually have a better quality of life by emphasizing uh, different kinds of goods that you know might be more favorable to sustaining the environment. Mm -hmm. It might mean uh, valuing leisure more. But then even if you have leisure more, if it's just leisure so you can go shopping, it doesn't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. It has to be because you want a different life. And once you start raising those, those kinds of questions, they're very radical questions. 
uh, they're radical both in terms of workers' consciousness, but they're actually radical in terms of having to change the mechanisms of society. Because the way workers are disciplined in capitalism is to always want consumer goods. And if you meet those needs, you create new needs. Consumerism is absolutely fundamental. Mm -hmm. Because what it's basically doing, you know, the basic point about capitalism is that you're selling your creative power as a human being and letting somebody else control it and how it develops. And in exchange for this, you get the power to consume. And to challenge that is to challenge capitalism. Uh, I'll just throw in here that uh, one thing that struck me when Stanley Ronowitz ran for governor on the Green Party, uh, one of the planks in Stanley's campaign was... When was this? Oh, don't ask me that. Okay. Uh, one of the planks in his campaign was um, about making life joyful. Mm -hmm. And that was, it's, that is so radical. Yeah. It's really revolutionary to talk about happiness aside from consumption. Yeah. But I think, um, and I totally agree with what you're saying at yeah. the same time, we can't, in the global north, we can't impose that. No, um, and that's and why... We, we can't deny the disparity and the need for people in the global south to have access to the material comforts yeah. and services that yeah. we have in the global no, north. I think we, yeah, I think we do have to think about the fact that people need a basic material well-being, access to material goods, and security uh, before you can talk about, you know, what Stanley is raising. Mm -hmm. You know, in the North, to talk to people about, well, you know, this should be about joy. Well, yes, but you want some security and you want some basic necessities. Right. It's hard to be joyful if you're starving. Yeah. So then, yeah, people have, you know, quality food and they have other, you know, they have their basic necessities and they, you know, there's things that people want to enjoy in terms of right. music, music, which means, you know, material things that you want to buy. But it, it, yeah, it's just such a large change. That's why it is so radical. And I don't think that change happens through lecturing to people about how they should change what they value. It happens through struggles and changing your values through those right. struggles. Right. So this, the third question related to that, about uh, the contradiction that production has shifted to the southern core of capitalist production. Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you, but, you know, again, with some qualifications, if, if you look at manufacturing goods, uh, you know, just quantitatively, yeah, a lot of manufacturing is now taking place uh, in the global south. But if we think of production as including services, and if we think of production uh, as not just the assembly, you know, if you look at uh, an iPod, you know, there's people who have to develop the programs, there's the marketing in the north, uh, you know, if you're looking at a global economy and multinational corporations, business services are amazingly significant uh, factors. Uh, engineering, mm -hmm. consulting, legal, there's a lot of people employed in all these sectors. A lot of these are still concentrated in the north. So we should say manufacturing. Services. So manufacturing has shifted and, you know, certain, again, it's, there's still a hierarchy that you're starting with. Mm -hmm. Because what you see even in manufacturing is the highest ends of those manufacturing goods, the research and development, the high-tech mm -hmm. things, are still concentrated in the north. And the, uh, the lower end, even in high-tech goods, is in the south. So there's still a hierarchy being re restru uh, reconstructed here. Uh, but, yeah, you have to think in terms of there's been a major shift in terms of... Uh, Production, but you know, if we're also talking about services, services, some of them happen, a lot of them haven't, and a lot of them can't be because they have to be locally. Okay, yeah. I think we answered that question, which was um, what can we in the northern periphery do about the contradiction that production has shifted to the southern core of capitalist production, even as political power and dominance continues to flow in reverse? Yeah, so let me, maybe I just would add that just to clarify it <coughs> that. When we talk about what is international solidarity in this context, uh, I think we have to be careful in terms of thinking about what we can do. I mean, we haven't built much solidarity mm. locally. Public private sector workers' divisions, you know, unions competing and everything else. So to imagine that we could create an international solidarity, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an illusion until we can actually prove we can build that class solidarity here. And here, if we're struggling, that's the point I was making earlier, that creates openings for others to also struggle. 
rather than giving up and everybody being forced down. And then there is the things that happen from time to time where international solidarity becomes very important, like the U.S. threatening to invade Venezuela. Well, then you mobilize. That's a very specific thing to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any thoughts on what's happened to capitalism since you completed the book? I guess the main thing that happened since we, as we were completing the book, I guess would be fair to say, uh, uh, is that we started well before the crisis, and then the crisis hit. And I think we underestimated the extent to which, if there was a crisis, how deep it would become, how the interlocks in finance, how profound they were, and how things would, you know, the extent to which things would unravel, and how hard it would be to put it together again. I think we underestimated it. On the other hand, uh, you know, our argument always was that, uh, you know, the American empire was central to the making of global capitalism. And I think that was confirmed by the role mm. the U.S. played. The Fed developed new capacities for managing and saving the banks. Uh, one of the really critical things, uh, you know, that, that happened was that, uh, whereas in the 30s, when you get this, the last time we had a crisis like this, the question of interna the internationalization of capitalism actually gets challenged. You get protectionism, you get breakdowns. And here, in spite of how deep this was, in spite of some tensions, they kept it going. They kept it going as an international system, and the U.S. was central to that. The U.S., when it was flooding the, money, uh, the market with money, it was also thinking about Europe needs this. This is going to be channeled into Europe. It was meeting with everybody, to, you know, they were passing at the G20. Uh, after you know, the demonstrations we had in Toronto, but the communique there with, that came out was uh, we have a united commitment to free trade and the free flow of capital. Mm. So global capitalism had this major bump, but it's continuing. And, you know, and uh, the volatility is going to continue in finance, but global capitalism is continuing. And, it, you know, as long as we're so weak that we're not a factor in limiting it because they have to legitimate themselves or anything, uh, we leave them the time and the space to develop new ways to continue this. Mm. We're on the defensive. Yeah. As long as we're on the defensive. Um, how do you think the current political impasse in the United States relates to your analysis about America's informal empire? Uh, in particular, just how rational and capable of planning for international capital as a whole is the, United, is the yeah. U.S. state? So two things. Uh, I mean, one thing is, we're not saying the U.S. is omnipotent. It's incredibly difficult to run this kind of an empire in terms of keeping things together. They've really come to the conclusion that they can't prevent crises, so it's about price, crises containment. They, mm -hmm. they explicitly think this way. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have to appreciate the fact that one of the cr main criticisms, uh, uh, contradictions in terms of the U.S. is that it's the state of global capitalism. It's acting on behalf of global capitalism, but it's also the state of its own social formation. Right. So pressures internally are very important. Now, it would be one thing if those pressures were coming from the working class and demanding things. Where they've come from in the U.S. has been from the right. So it's been from the Tea Party. And what you do see is a lot of chaos, a lot of people wondering about the ineptness of being able to run a global empire when you can't even get your budget uh, in, in order, uh, but I think what you also see there is as far as the Tea Party can go and as far as it is useful, it's also been a barrier for capital and they've also tried to contain it mm -hmm. and deal with it. And when the crunch comes, they've been able to uh, basically ride over that and do what is necessary to keep financial markets going, to keep people retaining their confidence that uh, you can trust the U.S. to protect your bonds or whatever. So you have, again, you have this tension between the international for the American state and having to cope with the domestic mm. uh, and domestic nationalism. Which we saw in the budget. Yeah, which you saw in the whole fight around the budget. The budget. Yeah, and you know, some of, you know, and the role of the Tea Party. So you saw those tensions, but you also saw them being able to, mm. you know, get over that. Okay. Um, have there been changes in the political situation <clears throat> in the global north that affect your analysis of the social democratic parties, in particular the British Labour Party and the NDP? No, I think it just confirmed 
you know, our perspective, not just our perspective, but a lot of the perspectives that uh, people had before we went into this crisis, which was that uh, options in this kind of global neoliberal capitalism are limited. If you're just trying to go kind of a middle of the road direction, you get squashed. There's just no room there. Mm -hmm. And uh, social democracy has not at all been willing to contemplate any radical options. And this was shown during this crisis, in spite of all the openings to actually go after them in any way, uh, they actually held back and are trying to just legitimate themselves to capital. And that raises the second, I think, more important critique of social democracy, which is not about policy. It's that social democracy has never seen its goal, because it doesn't really believe in transforming society, as building the capacities amongst working people, mm. the analyti analytical capacities, organizational capacities, uh, you know, to you know, to, to, to take on change, to transform themselves so they can transform society. And if you're not doing that, even when you get elected, then you say, well, what can we do? The workers aren't there. They're not, you know, you haven't done the education. You haven't developed means of struggle. Workers aren't moving into motion. So that was always, you know, that's been a problem with social democracy for a long time. And it was just confirmed. You know, here was a moment when we shouldn't be on the defensive. They should be on the defensive. And we're on the defensive again. And we don't have a political expression to go on the defensive, and that's been the problem with being linked to the Democratic Party or being linked to social democracy. Mm -hmm. And what I, I think, in a sense, it's beginning to suggest is that what's actually practical now is the radical. Uh, not being radical isn't even practical. There's nothing that you get from it. They just demand more. And it's, it's a moment in time when we have to think about the radical uh, is becoming more practical, and that means that a lot of things that the left says, I think, can you know, be heard more sympathetically. But we have to organize ourselves so we can do that. Okay, well, thank you. Do you want to add anything else? No, it's great. Thank you. Thank you.